Rebecca, let's talk about art therapy. You're an art therapist. You know, let's talk about that. What do you say? I, I know some stuff about it. I'm willing to share my knowledge over the internet. Yeah. So I got a email from patron Jung or Young or Jung. But before we get into that email, let's introduce the podcast. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a professor and a therapist. Who are you, Rebecca? Uh, my name is Rebecca Bloom, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a board-certified art therapist. I just survived a four-day psychodrama retreat, and I kind of want to talk about that at some point. Ooh, and let's talk about that in another episode. <laughs> what do you say? Okay. <laughs> and I, I tweet and Barely anybody pays attention at our Bloom ATR. Our Bloom ATR tweet. Okay. Patron Jung or Jung or I'm not sure. Hi, Dr. Kirk. I really enjoy your podcast and it's helped me develop a deeper appreciation for psychology. I want to study psychology on a deeper level. My background is in art and I have a BFA. Actually, no, this episode is about art therapy and and uh, and sex therapy. But anyway, so my background is in art, and I have a BFA in sculpture mm -hmm. from my home country of South Korea, mm -hmm. and I also have an MA in visual studies in the United States. Wow. I am interested in sex therapy and art therapy. The problem is I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you could lead me in the right direction. Rebecca, where does Jung start for... Art therapy. You're an art therapist, right? To, are we saying that Jung wants to get it or to to study it? Study it. Yes, study, study it. it. Uh, so the place that you would start was you'd probably go to the American Art Therapy uh, webpage, arttherapy.org, and there listed are a bunch of approved, all of the approved programs. My advice would be to attend an approved program just because later getting your credits to become your hours to become a board-certified art therapist, it's a lot harder. So it sounds like you probably have the art credits. I think you need something like 24 art credits. Uh, so the question is, do you have the psychology credits? I think it's abnormal psych, developmental, and psych 101. Maybe there's a couple psych classes you need to have taken, but it'll have it listed there on the website. Um, I tell everybody to do some serious volunteer hours with a population that is having some functioning issues. Like any elder care facility in your city would probably gladly take you to do a one hour art time or a disadvantaged elementary school in your neighborhood. Can they do that without any training? Yeah. Just saying like, you know, do you have a craft time that I could be a volunteer at or, you know. So they're not doing therapy no. or counseling. They're just... They're just doing an activity with somebody that involves art. Yeah. Um, the reason I think this is important is when a lot of people think about being an art therapist, they think about being an art therapist for themselves. And so this idea that you're facilitating a creative experience for somebody who's a lower rate of functioning, who needs counseling for some reason, to get used to that. Because if you head into grad school without that experience... It usually can be, and it already is pretty shocking of how low functioning the clients will be at your internship. So I just like people to be kind of prepared um, because you're probably not going to be making art with a bunch of really high functioning people in a graduate program. That's not how you get trained. So what is it like to be an art therapist? Uh, what is it like? There's some existential angst. <laughs> it's like, am I making enough art with clients? Am I making enough of my own art? Why doesn't the world appreciate what I do more? Uh, why do I have to keep explaining what I'm doing? And then there's a lot of highs. Like, it's so powerful for people. I continue to have experiences where just simple activities, people, something ends up on the page and they're like, whoa, look at that. So you would feel underappreciated? What do you mean? You know, it's a pretty, I mean, when you ask people what are the helping professions, probably they say psychologist or psychiatrist. Maybe they know social worker. But I think very few people know that most of the line staff doing a lot of the community mental health in the United States are licensed mental health counselors, which I am. So I have that 
burden of identity, <laughs> being at the bottom of the ladder. And then art therapy is still, uh, it's pretty rare in most settings, especially on the West Coast. I think people in the New York City area or maybe in Florida, they've seen it more. But I, I remember when I came back from New York with a master's degree and I went to my job, my previous job that I had had before I left with the city HIV AIDS unit, and I told them I was back and I was going to use this degree, I got some of the most pathetic looks I've ever seen. <laughs> like, that's nice, Becca. <laughs> like, good luck with that. Um, yeah, I, re- I remember, and, you know, I can still kind of relate, but the first time I heard about art therapy was through colleagues and they had a similar attitude about it. They were saying, oh, well, they wouldn't have said this directly, but they were essentially saying, you know, it's just like drawing, you know, it seemed, they seemed to think it was frivolous. Yeah. Like, you know, real therapy is talk therapy and art therapy is either frivolous or silly or even narcissistic on behalf of the therapist mm-hmm. because they just want to create art for themselves as, as you know I think you were kind of alluding to earlier and having you know worked closely with art therapists in art therapy training programs for the past 15 years ever since Janice Hoshino uh, developed the program at Antioch University of Seattle I've come to respect it just as much as I respect any other field. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a legit form of therapy. It is highly regulated. It's highly professional. It's, uh, it can be extremely powerful for people and it's, you know, not any more or less frivolous than talk therapy, you know, (laughs) whatever you think of talk therapy, it's the same. And I feel bad for art therapists because of this, you know, notion that's out there, not only perhaps among the public, but among professionals. As a marriage and family therapist, you didn't even mention us, by the oh, way. Oh, right. You're Sorry. You know, it's, well, that's just par for the course, you know, <laughs> like you, you, you listed the, the professions and, and marriage and family therapists are even lower than counselors in terms of, uh, you know, advertising or knowing about us. And so I I would say we're probably more known than art therapists, Mm -hmm. but not much. And so I can absolutely relate to it. I, you know, on one hand, I'm just like, do I really need the public or even my field to justify my place in the world? No, but it, it does kind of um, bother me sometimes, you know, to be left off of, of a list. Who was I talking to recently? I can't remember, but but someone someone sent me something to read, or I can't remember what it was, but they oh I think they were actually re- they, as a you know program director at my university. I'll get emails every day asking you know solicitations and of some sort, and so someone sent me. A, a recruitment letter to recruit various professionals into their advocacy group of some kind, mm-hmm. and they and they listed all the different professions. You know, if you're this or that, we're you know we're totally open and we welcome all of you. And they left off marriage and family mm-hmm. therapists. And so, <laughs> I emailed her back and I was like, Yeah, I'll absolutely distribute this to all of my students in the couple and family therapy program, but it. I just a side note, you didn't mention us in in the list of of people. And then she emails me back and she's like, "Oh my god, I, I'm so sorry. I'm a marriage and family therapist." So we we even leave ourselves right. off the list for Christ's sake. Yeah. So I, you know, I can relate and you know, it's 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 a it's a funny thing to I'm sure it's similar in the medical professional profession, you know, like I'm sure, I don't know, foot doctors don't get any respect, you know, it's like, oh, you're just, you're just doing feet. You're, you're not doing like the heart or the brain, you know, you're just, in, you know, you're just doing feet, big deal or, or pediatrics, you know, or you just, you're just working with snotty nose, snot nose kids. Yeah, I think like, they get the love. They, really? Oh yeah. But within the profession, I wonder, right. Okay. In terms of like, who's, 
when they, when a you know pediatrician walks into the conference, I'm just guessing they don't get as much oohs and ahs as when a heart surgeon walks into the room. Just a, just a guess. Um, but anyway, so so identity problems. Well, let me ask you another question. Mm-hmm. So at Antioch University, Seattle, art therapists are either clinical mental health counselors like yourself mm-hmm. or they're marriage and family therapists like myself mm-hmm. because you can't become just an art therapist in Washington State and I'm, I'm guessing in a lot of states. You have to be licensed as either – you have to be licensed in something else and then you become additionally certified as an art therapist. Right. There are some states that are working really hard to make art therapy certified or licensed in that state. And there's a lot of debate within the field itself because really for me the reason that that license matters is that insurance companies will pay for it. So there's this idea of a license with no teeth. Um, Like, is it better to be under a bigger umbrella and be a licensed mental health counselor and be able to be paneled with insurance that way? Or would it be better to be in a tinier slice and be an art therapist, um, have their own licensure? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, for me personally, it's better to be in a bigger pie um, I've seen what happened in New York. That was the first state to do it. And there were some serious problems with the state coming in and regulating too quickly a field that it really didn't understand. Well, they do. Uh, it just made it harder for people to get jobs, to get, get entry level jobs, because then all of a sudden everybody wanted a, um, licensed art therapist, whereas people needed training level jobs before they could have so that they could get to that that level. Does that make sense? And yeah. People needed jobs right out of school to get their hours. And- yeah, and it, it, for those that don't know, in order to become fully licensed, you have to have a certain number of years after graduation, and it's usually two years. And so, uh, so there's this. So when you're in graduate school, you're in graduate school, and then you graduate. And then there's this two-year time before you're actually fully licensed. And what you're saying is no one wanted to hire those art therapists who were right out of school but weren't fully licensed yet. Right. So there was some real tenuous stuff like, oh, we don't want to you know, piss off the regulators. Um, but just like in Washington State, there's now a LMHCA, a Marriage and Family A, which is called yeah. Associate, which means I'm just in the beginning. And there are right. jobs that are kind of geared for that associate time. Um, right. In other words, that two-year period of time before you're fully licensed but you're graduated, you have an associate license, right. which uh, is a new thing, at least in Washington State. And it, it makes it sound like you're, you know, you're licensed, but you're almost there. Right. right. <laughs> and that helps people have more confidence in your, you know, competence level. One uh, last question, or a couple last questions about art therapy. Um, I think I've asked you this before. Do you think that it's irresponsible for therapists or counselors to use an art therapy directive or some style of art therapy without an art therapy education or certification? So I think many, like I use um, guided meditations all the time. Am I certified in mindfulness or you know, no, but I've done it enough and done it on myself enough that I feel comfortable of when to use it with a client. Uh, so, you know, I even have a self-produced book of directives I think are safe to do with clients. The thing about being an art therapist that is more than just the art project is it's a whole context of the way that you conceptualize what's going on for the client and this really the space that you develop that art could happen at any time which I don't see with my friends who do one or two art projects in a session with a client just like you would get a book that has um, dbt skills and and do a worksheet with your client on that you may not be trained in dbt but you feel confident doing this one worksheet it's part of your repertoire so I I am totally fine with people having a directive or two that they feel really experienced in. They've done the directive themselves. 
and they feel comfortable doing it with the client. Um, I just, I do this presentation all the time. I just did it for the staff at the Harborview unit. Um, I mean, the danger gets in when people are using language that's not so great. Like, that's a really pretty picture. Right. Or, or, ew, I don't like that picture you drew of your mom. Why would you yeah, make my... her so ugly? Like, that's, if you have art. Or, or someone, you know, expresses anger and trauma through art and they get afraid and worry that this kid is going to kill someone or something because they drew a gun, you know. Right. That kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And I see art, frankly, I see art therapists do that sometimes. Yeah. Um, I mean, also, I think especially if you're working in many communities, communities of color, immigrant communities, jail populations, incarcerated, um, you know, we don't own art. We don't own creativity. And I think that that can be a negative aspect of our therapists when they somehow feel like we've invented the creative process being therapeutic. Like, I think yeah. that's, like, inherently yeah. racist and disempowers many clients. So there's all kinds of things that people can get trained in that are they don't need an art therapy license, like Zentangle, Soul Collage. Um, you can even do a MARI training in Maldala analysis. So, you know, if you're really interested in it, spend some time and get some training. Yeah. For me... Uh, you know, just uh, in my work with my clients, I started using art with children. And I don't even know if I call it art, really. <laughs> it's just like, um, c you know, coloring and drawing and interacting through that. It, I found through trial and error, or my clients teaching me this essentially, that with a seven year old, you have two options. Typically, you can play. Uno or art. Yeah, you can play with them, like pretend or or games like Uno, or you're creating something. <laughs> Legos is a form of art therapy, I would call it. Um, you're uh, drawing or coloring or something, and because children don't sit knee to knee with the therapist, you know, on a couch and talk about their mothers, you know, the way that adults will. And so I just learned, well, if, if I'm not going to use art, I, I can't work with this person, mm -hmm. especially some kids. I'll never forget this one, one, one of my more recent children clients, all she wanted to do, uh, in the style of Ace of Base was to draw. Mm -hmm. All she wanted to do is draw. She was obsessed with drawing throughout the day, and it, you know, was true when she came to therapy. And so that's all we did. Mm -hmm. We we talked very little and she would sit down and she would grab my pen and paper. And I don't have an art supplies. <laughs> I just have like a pad of paper with just a regular pen and she would just go to town. Mm -hmm. And we did, I thought, some very deep work through that. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm just, I think we've talked about this before and I'm just sort of, I was wondering what you would say i sort of forgot but i was pretty sure you'd you'd be intelligent about that because you're an intelligent person rebecca thank you i need to hear that that's why i do this show so, <laughs> <laughs> um a couple more questions do you have to be an artist to be an artist you have to do some art <laughs> you need like 16 art credits from an approved college not like you took an art class down the street but you need to have gotten those credits in college like those wine and painting classes you can't count that um okay. yeah so have you ever done that before i have done that i did that my friend was raising money for uh, some charity and i went and uh i painted a very strange picture compared to everybody else who followed the instructions of the instructor i kind of just went off in my own cosmic experience um yeah yeah i always love those pictures where it's like you know all eight of the participants will pose at the end a little rosy cheeked and you know showing their paintings and there's always like one person with like this the strangest <laughs> every other version looks you know vaguely similar like a bird on a tree or something and then someone's like just so different you just gotta wonder like that person 
marches to the beat of a different drum. Yeah, my picture, I think the directive was, it was like a sunset and then a black cityscape over it. And mine looked like a scene on a firefly. It was like a future planet, some kind of advertisement with some like kind of future vaguely Asian writing. Like there was something really different going on in mine. <laughs> Um, what's a session look like typically, you know, what, what, cause people have a hard time visualizing therapy anyway, but what's art therapy? What would they see if they were looking in through the window of your office? So we probably talk for the first 10 minutes and then if there's something that I feel would be helpful, I'll suggest it and the client can always reject it. So like I go crazy at thrift stores and buy all the strange things that everybody else thinks are junk. So I was at this thrift store, and one of the things I love to find is that bisque ware from, like, you paint pottery shops that hasn't been painted yet. Um, and I found this one that looked like a shield. And I had a client who was separating from their spouse, and it just seemed perfect. Like, there was this real fear about telling people and feeling I'm protected and I said you know I found this thing and it looks like a shield do you want to make a shield today and they were like yes <laughs> that sounds awesome and so while they were so I have also as an art therapist I know more about materials than you do and so I have things in my office that are awesome and expensive and I know how to use them yeah. and one of them is Copic markers which are graphic artist quality markers that are like five dollars a piece um, this is what uh, anime, this is how people color comic books as they use these markers. Mm. So they're like super high quality. And so we, and also as an artist, like I'm always mixing things up. So I've discovered over time that these Copic markers work great on bisque wear. Um, and so they decorated their shield and it was full of symbolism and it had a lot of weight to it because of the ceramics. And that was really attractive to me as a therapist. I wanted to give this person something that had weight to it. Because when you're going through a separation, everything is so up in the air, literally. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about things in an artistic, conceptual way. Cool. Yeah. And some of your clients, you don't do any art therapy yeah. with, correct? And I was just talking to one of my art therapy supervisees. The other day, like, you know, sometimes a big chunk of time will go by and I'll realize, like, I have not made art with any of my clients. Like, I got to, what's up with that? What's my own resistance? Really? Like, like, what's that, like weeks? Yeah, sometimes. Weeks will go by without making art with any of your clients. Maybe not weeks, but. Well, I'm just, that, that surprises me. I thought, I was under the impression that, that it was just more interwoven with with most of your clients, you know, or at least one of your clients, because you see clients all week long, right? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have the privilege of running. You have a new office. How's that Yeah, it's out? great. I have a full-time private practice in beautiful Hillman City. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be tough. Like, people can be in real intense crisis, you know, like you hit certain types, times of year. I would say for me, I don't know if you find this in your practice, but the end of Summer can be that way in a practice where everybody's in major crisis huh. and it can be oh, hard yeah. to say, like, can we make art about that? You know, it's like you're really problem solving with somebody trying to figure out, you know, how to keep a relative out of inpatient. Like, yeah. you know, you're doing some pretty intense work and sometimes it's easy to say, let's make art about that. And sometimes, you know, I'm tired and I don't want to do the cleanup and, um, you know, it's cyclical. I mean, I would say just like meditation or anything else, like it is a practice and you get out of the practice and you have to get back into the practice. Is it laziness? It can be on my part. Yeah. So I, I can imagine just being a little tapped out. You might just be like, you know what? I'll take a, I'll do, I'll do a good session with this person, but I'm not going to take any massive risks because I, I don't have the energy for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. And some of it can be timing too. Like, um, you've really got to be able to break the client's narrative. And yeah. So like, we're going to make art now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're in the middle of a sentence and you're, and you're just shoving pens in their face. And, you know, I just realized that, that the word marker is literally the verb of, or the, I don't know, it's the, the form is mark, to mark. It's to mark something. A marker marks something. Do you ever have that where you realize that, that a word has 
it's just so obvious mm-hmm. the where the word came from. Yeah. I I have I I feel like I'm often late to realize these things. Recently, a couple months ago, I realized the word understand is literally under. You know, you stand under mm-hmm. something. You're standing under, so you get it. You know, you're you're holding it up or you're supporting, or it's like you've got it. You know, and just all these different words like marker. Marker is to mark. I don't think I ever realized that. Well, sometimes I like to call art therapy marks on the page therapy. Okay. Because then people get less stressed out. So recently there was this thing going around on Facebook. Uh, you know, who are the four uh, fictional characters that best represent you? So I did Buffy, uh, M- Molly Ringwald from Pretty in Pink, and Eeyore. Those are my three. <laughs> To much comment. You know, it was really fun. Lots of comments from different people, different thoughts about that. But I thought the one really funny comment was from my friend who's a psychologist. She said, you know, that Buffy image is funny, but she should be holding, she's holding like a, you know, she's holding the wooden dagger. And she said, you know, she should be holding a paintbrush. And I just had to crack up because I was like, she's holding an art object. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I could make art with that stick that she's got. Um, so, like, that's thinking like an art therapist. You know, like, we can only make art if we have, like, the perfect materials and everything is set up and clean. Whereas the art therapist would be like, what, you got a stick? Great. Like, uh, let's go make some art with that. Let's... Right. And the word art is associated with such lofty things yeah. for most people. To think that okay, you're going to now create art and, and, you know, like to ask a client, make art now. (laughs) Um, But it's much easier to say, you know, put some marks on some pages, you know? Yeah, and, you know, I say, like, what we're going to do is really simple. It's probably going to take just, you know, 10 minutes. Um, You might not even like what you produce, which in art is, you know, not an option for a lot of people. Um, So... Yeah, it's it's hard in this culture to introduce the creative arts. And there's actually a great article on that, on this very controversial drama therapist. He's not, well, anyways, his name is David Reed Johnson. And he wrote this article like 20 years ago that was talking about how America loves sports, but is scared of the arts. Yeah. And that's why their vocational therapy uh, is and rec therapy is was so much more recognized in the time that he's talking about it when there was funding for such things and art therapy, dance therapy, music therapy, drama therapy were on the outsides um, because we fund the sports <laughs> yeah. and we're kind of nervous about what happens in the arts. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I just getting back to something you're saying earlier, just the action of having someone begin uh, putting marks on a page in therapy, just that alone is therapeutic because it's it takes so much for them to. There's so many barriers they have to overcome just to begin that process. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to feel safe. They have to commit. They have to. Uh, I don't you know, have to uh, have good enough supplies that it's worth their time. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. They have like a basket of pens that don't work. Yeah. And they're like, how come my client never makes art? And it's like, have you attempted to make art with those crusty old pens? <laughs> yeah. You can't make art with those. You know, you at least need to commit to the process a little, you know. You need to, if you're going to do it, spend some money on it and do it right. Well, that does it for this episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. 